Most of you know enough about me, I think, but I, I, let me tell you a few things that you, you should maybe know. Um, I sail a boat, here's my boat, uh, which is, um, is relevant. Here it is in a, from a different angle. <laughs> it's 104 years old. No, no, we didn't buy it new. Um, <laughs> uh, when we first got it, which was a couple of years ago, we'd been sailing a quite exotic, low carbon fibre, high tech, rather flashy thing. And, uh, and thought we, we were pretty good sailors, really. Uh, we got on this, we made a lot of changes to it, and, and it went spectacularly slowly. We, we were rubbish. <laughs> and then we talked to some of the old fellows who'd been sailing these things um, for the previous century and learned heaps. So we've, we've ended up with a boat that's, that's full of, of craft um, and uh, it's got a century of experience above the deck and below the deck looks a bit like NASA, you know, wireless network, laptops, goodness knows what else. And that combination turns out to be pretty hot. It, uh, you don't need me to spell out um, the relevance of that to education. That, that craft of teaching um, is enormously important. Uh, and what we've been able to do with it, with technology, has, has frankly been astonishing. I'm lucky enough to be all around the world, as you'll see in, in, in a moment. And these days I'm a professor in Madrid, um, as well as in Bournemouth, which is, which is um, nice. Great lunch, you know. <laughs> But this was a conference. I was in Madrid. Um, just, just, I've just come back from a couple of months in Australia. But you'll see it was there, Global Education Forum, and uh, and you'll see it's full of the usual sort of um, uh, worthy souls. But I just wanted to draw your attention, really, here to the fact that look, it's kids that are hosting it, and uh, it's kids that are the feedback panel, and uh, that summary of the whole thing at the end is done by kids. So you know, all around the world, I think. People are, are, are rediscovering what learning looks like, and they're all doing it without exception with their students. I don't see a model of learning for children. I see a model of learning with children, and uh, we'll come back to that for sure during the morning. So uh, um, I've got some extraordinary projects. This is, um, this is out in the Cayman Islands, where we, I was lucky enough to help rebuild the entire education system. And this is just an interesting picture, because the, the school you can see on the screen there which is Stepping Stone School in Hindhead in Surrey, that's the entire school population there. The whole, every kid on roll, and a friend, actually, there's an extra kid there. And the uh, Little Cayman School is in the foreground here, um, with the four children who live on that one island. Only 130 people on the island, and four of them are kids. When I first went there, um, I popped into the school, and uh, Arrow here, who's the big boy, who was 10, uh, was sitting on his own in a classroom. And I thought he'd, he'd been naughty or something. I said, what's Arrow doing sitting on his own? And they said, well, he's in the room for 10-year-olds. We've only got one, um, which just seemed extraordinary, really. Uh, but, you know, why would you put a child in the room because he's only 10 uh, on his own? I, I don't think that's any more extraordinary than putting 25 children in a room because they happen to be um, 10 or 14 or anything else. It's not a, it's not a music grade teacher in the country who would say to you, you can't do your grade 7 because you're too young. They just want you to crack on. And for sure, um, we're going to have to look hard, I think, at some of the structures and strictures of our learning. Um, in the Caribbean, we were lucky, of course, because um, Hurricane Ivan blew down all the schools. So we had, the, we had the joy of rebuilding them all again. But what was interesting was the teachers, having been um, stuck with teaching in, in car parks and gymnasiums and goodness knows where else, all said, when we, when we started rebuilding the school, they said, well, whatever. Just don't put us back in our boxes. We've, we've really enjoyed working together. It's been great. Um, and, and when I look around the world, it is those big moments of, of revolution in Australia, the building educational revolution um, in investment in schools have provided one large building in every school. And those big agile spaces have been, that's where they've been um, harboring their super classes and all the other things we'll, um, we'll reflect on during, during the day. So just wanted to give you a sense. Yeah, I've still got some fabulous... PhD students um, uh, who are looking at I mean, things like what, what on earth do we mean by creativity? You know, it's on the lips of every um, uh, every policy paper. It's on the lips of every. What, what do we mean by creativity? And for me, I think the word ingenuity is a little closer to what we're looking for. I think we want children who can cope with the extraordinary unexpected world that they're going to find themselves in um, in the next century um, of their lives. I, I hate it when people talk about 21st century. Um, schools, because if you're 10, that's the only place you've ever lived, really. It's a bit late to be um, preparing. Look, I want you to have a look at this. This will take you back to your childhood days, uh, I think, reasonably well. Um, do you remember this? The, um, 
The trick here is to decide whether the horizontal line at A is longer than the horizontal line at B. Let's just see how we're doing. Uh, who thinks A is longer? And who thinks B is longer? And who thinks they're both the same? And, uh, um, well, uh, only, only two of you um, doubted uh, <laughs> that, and, and, and you both got it wrong. So well, I, think, I think what I want you to do, really, is to, is to sit and look again at all the things you thought were certainties in the way we've, we've built and designed our schools. I mean, you, 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 we're in a time of tough funding, for sure. There's going to be a lot less money. You look at um, High Tech High in San Diego, best performing school in uh, Southern California, and they're running on an average weighted pupil unit to $2,500 um, per year. You know, so we're, you know, the, the luxury of educational finance we've enjoyed, um, certainly um, with, with Jim and before, uh, uh, it, you know, we're not going to have that large S um, again. And, and I, I think faced with tight money, Historically, people have done two things. They've either tried to go back in time, you know, let's go back to the 1970s and, and when things were simpler, uh, you know, uh, Latin and triple science and so on. Uh, or let's, let's play the productivity card and let's say to teachers, you know, would you just one more time work a little harder um, for a little less? Well, we've played the productivity card already, played it well, got some gains, and, and there's no card left to play. So if we can't go forward into some world of new productivity, and clearly we're not going to go backwards into the 1970s because the companies have all gone apart from anything else, uh, then the only place we've got left to go is to somewhere different. And what's exciting, I think, at the moment is we, we're facing that variety of, of possibilities. I mean, these are... I was just trying to work out the entire list of, of potential schools here at the moment. I think it comes to about 19 different sorts of... Of, uh, of school types and gov governance. And to be honest, I applaud that and welcome it because I think we need that diversity to let a thousand flowers bloom and to see what just what works and what, and what doesn't work. It's a long and rather exciting list. Um, and, well, let's, let's start then, perhaps, with, with a, a reflection on children. And unashamedly, look, I'm a granddad, so you're going to get um, a couple of granddad photographs. Uh, here's... Here's one. This is um, granddaughter Emily, uh, just came out to her second birthday, and she's posing for her swimming club photograph. And as you'll know, if your parents or, or recent grandparents, she's doing all this underwater. She's the, 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 the um, swimming club teacher is underwater with the camera. She's swum up, done a little two-year-old pose, a sweet smile, and then swims off. Now, you know, when, when most of you were kids, you learned to swim with, with massive support. You had armbands or some of you even perhaps water wings, you know, uh, or whatever, you know, and you had, you had somebody with a hand under your stomach and you had massive parental. But now we just chuck the kids in the pond and off they go. They swim like little torpedoes. They go whizzing off. They can't surface very well, um, but they do go rather well un underwater. And, um, and it's interesting when you take them on holiday to countries where they don't do that yet to see the look of terror on adults' faces as a little two-year-old, one-year-old, she started at six months, just come running down, throw themselves in the water and just disappear for some distance. They'll do widths, you know, without, without surfacing. Similarly, um, yeah, here she is on her second birthday, which is the last picture I think I'm going to bore you with, but uh, most of you would have... Well, when did you learn to cycle, most of you? Just shout out the age you learned to ride a bike. Five. Five? Four. Four was precocious. Well done. That's, um, Ten would be quite normal, yeah, absolutely. Um, nobody yet at 18 months. Well, balance bikes, which is another great um, fad. You'll, you'll know about these if, you're, um, if you've got young kids around you. Balance bikes are like real bikes, but they have no pedals. And here's Amelie on her balance bike, the um, very first time she gets on. Uh, this is her birthday. It's a slight incline. Her feet are off the ground. She balances. Turns out kids can cycle bikes all along. It can't stop, she doesn't do braking, you know, unfortunately, but it does everything else, you know. And about six months after that, you put the pedals on the bike and they cycle off down the road completely um, confidently. Now, again, you know, that we limited them, we put the stabilizers on their bikes, we gave them uh, tricycles even, and we limited them to, to cycling only as fast as their dad and mum could run or um, adult of choice, you know. Uh, and and in, in truth, they could do it all along. I think what we're learning as we look around the world at what other people are doing in their education systems is that kids can do things way better, way better than we ever thought. They can get there quicker. Let's look at what is happening um, around the world. Look, here's, here's a moment in Australia 
with super classes. Now, look, I was I was drummed out of the NUT as a as a young zealot um, uh, teacher because, well, I, I marched on Westminster gym. I have to confess, you know. <laughs> but in 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 favour of smaller classes, we all thought smaller classes should be should be um, you know surely you wouldn't put children in a class of more than eighteen. Uh, and now I find myself as the greatest advocate of, of super classes where we've got kids of 60, 90, 120 doing astonishingly well, doing five terms work in three terms and so on. You can see three super classes here of one sort or another. The top one uh, in Australia, the one below is 125 primary children in one class together. It's the quietest primary school I've been into in the last 12 months. And over on the right hand side, that's one of the prototype plazas at New Line. Academy down, down in Kent. Now what happens when you teach 90 kids, let's just take 90 together in a, in a space or, or three classes worth of kids perhaps, and these days 75 or 80, is crucially the detail really matters. You, you need key roles for the teachers. You don't just drive them in a room and you have two people sitting at the back doing a bit of marking or one person with a, a, chair, a chair and a whip trying to manage the lesson. You have key roles and the children are, are given very clear badging uh, as to what those rules are. One teacher leads, is the, it the narrates the lesson, leads on the front, says, you know, when, when I call attention, you really do need to focus on what I'm saying because you're going to get lost. These are longer time blocks. I don't know anywhere in the world that hasn't moved up with its teaching time blocks in the countries that are going really fast. I've got uh, big projects in Norway up in the Arctic Circle. Kids typically doing one day per, per subject. You know, you do, if it's Tuesday, you do biology, if it's Wednesdays, you know, I'm sure, that, that immersion is massively motivating and, and you don't waste, you know, if you're, on, if you're in a secondary school, you're still on a 45 minute timetable, then just, just get the kids to get out their stopwatches and time it for you, and you'll find that the, the time they take putting away, moving, getting out, and starting again is roughly 20% of the, of the learning week. So if you're on a if you're on a 45 minute timetable, you're throwing away Friday every single week, and uh, and you know how busy you are. So why would you do that? So these are these are much bigger blocks of time. They're immersive time. Uh, the second teacher is the think of them as the sort of AA van or R R A C van. The minute you get stuck or have a wobble or are uncertain, uh, that 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 person with the blue badge comes rushing over and and stands at your your elbow and says, "How are you? How are you stuck? You know, how can I help you?" You don't, you know, how many times have you been in the class, you've said to a kid, um, yeah, I, I see your hand, I'll get to it in a minute, I see that you need my attention, but I'll just finish this. You know, one teacher in, 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 in a normal class, you know, has, can't multitask, you just have to bump things up back to back. In a, um, uh, the third person in the, uh, in the room, of course, is the, is the differentiator. They're looking to stretch and differentiate. They're looking, do you remember when a teacher said to you when you were a kid, Oh gosh, you know, I'm not supposed to tell you this yet, but I'll tell you anyway. It's quite exciting. You've got a little bit of A-level knowledge when you're doing your GCSEs or your O-levels or wherever you were. Um, and that, dif that differentiating teacher is going around looking for kids who are bored or coasting or, you know, interested in something else that haven't quite seen the relevance between... You know, you're doing Newtonian physics and you know they like motorbikes and you talk to them a bit about gear changes and... BMW shaft drive bikes and why they lean sideways because of centripetal force and suddenly you've got them back on track. So, you know, three key roles, three key teachers. And of course, those teachers only doing what a good teacher would do in series, but of course, three teachers doing it with specialists and do it in parallel. And in parallel, you know, nobody ever waits, nobody ever pauses, nobody ever coasts, nobody's ever lost. The pace of the lesson is jaw-dropping to see when you go in uh, and exciting too. So folks are trying all sorts of of interesting things. Let's see some of the things they're saying as, 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 as well. Um, perhaps let's, where should we go? Crikey, let's go to China perhaps. Um, I was with um, uh, Ken Chen just in March this, this year and uh, Ken was talking to the leadership conference there and uh, he said these things which I think um, you know, are, are, are absolutely spot on. You, know, you don't get to be good at anything by keeping doing it um, the same way. I had a project in Singapore just, just down the road where we took 14-year-old um, science, we gave the children video cameras, we got them to write up their science experiment with the video cameras, and we did it with 10-year-olds instead of 14-year-olds, and they romped through the work. We, we Actually, we did it with 11-year-olds, then 10-year-olds, and, and we had this EduQuest was the program, you want to Google it. Um, and as a result of that, uh, uh, um, Singapore immediately said, blimey, uh, and put science labs into all their primary schools, because they saw just like the kids on their bicycles, how fast their kids could go. Well, in Hong Kong, 
They're also saying uh, this, uh, <coughs> of course. And in Hong Kong, they're also saying this, of course. Uh, and Ken took a moment to remind us that just down the road in Singapore, they're also saying this, of course. So, you know, these, these countries are racing forward. They're not just harnessing technology. Technology has been the Trojan horse that's allowed them to think differently. But I'll tell you what, you don't see a lot of Dick Turpin teaching, um, stand and deliver teaching in those front-running schools. I was, um, I was there, I was excited to find uh, the conference opened by an iPad orchestra. Kids all leapt up with their iPads. A the little girl there is singing into her iPhone. She's modulating her voice rather like Che did when she started getting old. You know, she's uh, sort of modulating away there uh, with her finger touch. And what I loved about this image was the this American chap who leapt up in the background to video it and, uh, and forgot to turn the camera on. He was so completely captivated by the complexity of what they were doing, which I think is, uh, is rather nice and rather indicative. Right down to little tiny uh, things, which were joy. It was up in, um, up in Scotland uh, last year. It was a group of children, little tiny rural schools. I really liked small schools. Uh, learning to play brass instruments. They're learning to play on a little video link. But that's not the exciting thing. Uh, what's exciting is that this is a very mixed group. So the, the girl here in the middle, she, she's, uh, she's pretty expert. She's been playing for a year and a half. This girl's just started. And the person on the video link, of course, says, um, oh, I, I wonder, Charlotte, if you could just, just help out with fingering there. So he's remotely, you know, empowering the children locally to support and help each other with their, with their play, giving them licence to, to teach. In other words, what happened in that school, as in all the others, is it's transformed. You know, the children take that confidence and that mentoring and that mutuality back into the classroom. It doesn't just linger in the, um, in the video link room. Uh, or we could tiptoe into... Um, Oh, gosh, where else should we go? Uh, let's just um, tiptoe briefly into Thailand then, um, because, you know, in Thailand, blimey, you know, you've got places like TK Park, uh, which I had, the, I had the, the privilege in TK Park of, uh, of, of looking at the model of learning that they had in before they built it. TK Park is on the sixth floor of a shopping mall, and it's a learning place for parents and, and grandparents and children to come and learn. It's funded by the shops that are underneath it because uh, it's pulled so many footfalls through the retail space. Uh, and it's a spectacularly agile space. You can see the way that they're using, you know, curtaining. You can see that the way that they, everything, you can see the, can you see the curtain tracks absolutely everywhere and that sense of expectation that it will be a place of presentation and exhibition and celebration. Uh, and of course, it's a shoes off place. I think almost everywhere that I'm working around the world, the kids are learning with their shoes off. And if you haven't tried shoes off learning, there was something quite extraordinary. Uh, I, I, there's no research at all. It's what they do in Scandinavia because it's snowy outside. But something about third millennium learning that's about family and community and belonging rather than about productivity in a factory. You wear your boots in a factory. You take your shoes off when you get home. There's something about the signification of a family of learning that happens when you take your shoes off, not the least of which being that it's really hard as a boy to bully with your shoes on. Kids, boys just turn nice, you know. So we're in a very interesting position with all this. And um, uh, that position, I think, has, has been transformed by rapid and recent changes in where we are with technology. And I really just want to pick out um, a couple of things. I just want to pick out, really, um, mobile technologies briefly. And I'm sure most of you have got past the point of blocking and banning now. But uh, as, as you know... There are, there are sensible ways to use mobile technologies and not sensible ways. If you go to cloudlearn.net, cloudlearn.net, you'll see a really nice research project, crowdsourcing all the good advice from schools that are using Facebook, and Twitter, and YouTube, and mobile phones in the classroom. You'll see their model policies. You'll see their letters home to parent. Just, just pick it up and run with it. It's a great starting point. Uh, and it's not simple. None of this is simple. Here, it's me in a class in, uh, in West London. The kids were using their mobile phone to capture the key revision points from the lesson. They were using audio boo, I think, but I took my phone out to take a picture of them using their phone, and the class blogger there, you can see, leapt up with her phone to take a picture of me with my phone, taking a picture of their phone, if you see what I mean. You know, OK, this stuff probably has um, comfortably uh, arrived, and, and, indeed, and indeed it has. Um, and I think it's arrived to this extent. I think we're at a very, very clear line in the sand here. Uh, and that line in the sand is post-appropriation. I think the, the technologies that most of you grew up with in your school days as children or as teachers were mostly appropriated by education. You had a, 
a slide rule, but it had to be the right sort. You weren't allowed a cylindrical one or a, a, a circular one even. You know, you, you had a, this was the wrong calculator, re reverse Polish calculator. It didn't work the way calculators were, but got the right answer. It was perfectly sensible maths, but it did it in the wrong way. Um, so it was inappropriate and the right computer and so on. I've been, I've got projects all over the world. Well, not, not much in Britain, to be honest, these, these days. Uh, but I haven't yet found a school where they've got a class set of mobile phones. Uh, iPod touches, iPads, it's an absolute clear line in the sand that the phone belongs to the kids, and there it is. And, and you, you know full well you're heading towards a point where you're simply going to say to the kids, just, just rock up, bring your lunchbox, don't forget a pencil, bring your PE kit and a browser, end of. You know, and that will be their, their job, not your job. Uh, and of course there are some implications for that in terms of equity, but I'll tell you what, the cost of intervening where there is an equity issue is way lower than it was three, four, five, six years ago. My daughter, when she left primary school at 11, I looked at the processing power of her primary school as she left it. I looked at the phone in her pocket when she was 21. The phone in her pocket a decade later out, outperformed the primary school's entire computer network when she left it a decade before. You know that the phone in your pocket, you'll have seen this stat just the other day, uh, is, well, if you've got an iPhone, it outperforms the White House in 1995, which is quite an interesting figure, you know. So the pace of this, you know, your entire school network disappears into the pockets of your children within a decade. I mean, it'd be insane not to embrace that technology and to use it as a significant part of what you do. Not as all of what you do, but as a significant part of it. And that post-appropriation, I think, has opened up a whole heap of, of interesting challenges for us. Um, not the least of which being, what does the classroom look like? And this is a really interesting little space I'm just going to show you here. This is um, Lampton School in West London where my daughter teaches. And Lambton School, the children in that school, won a project uh, to design a classroom of tomorrow. It was funded by their local CTC, and I, I mourn their loss. Uh, here are the kids. It's a tough area. It's an outstanding school in a tough area. Um, Sue John, the head. Uh, and these kids won the competition, not because... This is where people go wrong so often with, with learner voice. You know, They say to the kids, what do you think you want? And you know, the kids, well, well, I want something a bit sparkling, can we have a disco? You know, what, what you need to do with Learner Voice is do the research. And what these kids did was they went off around the world, they Skyped off around the world, they talked to kids in other classrooms, they looked at what they were doing, they did the research and got very excited about the effect that might have on their learning. It was about great learning. What they asked for in, uh, in detail was, was surfaces that were writing surfaces, every surface, a writing surface, every desk, every wall. Uh, they wanted comfortable furniture. They said perfectly reasonably, when we read, we don't go and find an upright chair. When we're on holiday, we don't drag a chair from the, uh, from the hotel dining room down to the beach so we can get our backs properly upright so we can enjoy reading. We like to read and relax. And uh, you give us upright chairs, we won't like to read. So they wanted comfortable furniture to read on. They wanted mood lighting. They'd read a research piece from Yale University that suggested that coloured lighting impacted on children's motivation and engagement. They didn't believe it, but they liked the idea of the coloured lighting, but they wanted to be in control of it. They didn't want to have it motivated. This was a space they were making over, of course. You know. They said... You know, we like to work at different heights. Can we have, you know, sometimes you know, have a look at people on their laptops in Starbucks. You'll find sometimes they're standing, sometimes they're sitting, sometimes they're, they're relaxed. It doesn't matter what the mood is from the, from the lighting. Can we have that diversity? And they said, by the way, can we have the things that we use every day? Our Google Docs, our Facebook, our Twitter. But well, after they'd opened, I was excited to find this on their tweet stream, which is Lampton Citizens, or was. They've just changed class, actually. And I said, oh, look, this is, this is my first tweet. We're learning how to use Twitter. And I sent them some um, nauseously patronising, well done, you, you know. And, they, met, and they, they tweeted straight back. I said, it's not us, you fool. It's the teachers. We're showing them how to use the classroom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We've been on Twitter for years. You know? um, of course, they have. <laughs> now, what's interesting about that space are two things. Firstly, I showed that space down in Adelaide. Um, remember Keith, Keith Bartley used to be head of the GTC, he's now CEO in, in uh, South Australia. I was visiting one of his tough schools in Adelaide, showed them all that at 2.30 in the afternoon, went back the next morning at 9 o'clock, and what did I find? Well, this is 9.30, I took the photograph, I found the kids had found flat white surfaces in the school, pulled them all together, they were writing on them. Of course, when you write on a desk, you get that sense of audience, you look at each other's writing, they had their phones out so they could capture pictures of their writing, they had a sense of audience now and in the future. Um, and by the way, what are they writing about? Uh, they're writing about the impact of colour on their learning, and of course they had their shoes off. People tell me that schools can't change quickly. 
That was less than 12 hours. Of course they can. Um, uh, and they do need to change. And here's an, an interesting little interview I did with the kids who designed that about their hopes and dreams for what university life would be like. And I think, how are we doing for time, Jimmy? We've got about five minutes, haven't we? Something like that? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll just show you this and a couple of other things. So uh, I've, I've made this. This isn't public domain yet, but I made it to frighten vice chancellors because it seemed to me that they needed to be frightened, really. Um, so I'm assuming we've got some sound here. We're going to talk a little bit about university life, um, but tell me a little bit about... I just want to say I've lost a lot of weight since then. I feel really good about that. What's special about this place? Classroom was designed by students, uh, so it was designed by people who are going to use it um, now and for future generations, and it incorporates a lot of the things that we use at home and technology we use at home and technology we're familiar with, and I think that um, helps, and I think that's what makes this classroom like really unique. It's quite good for group work, so if we just want to move to our own space in the classroom and we need something to write, we don't have to search paper and pen, and we can just get one of the board pens and write things down. And I love the coloured light, now. does the coloured light change during the day? How does that... Yeah, they're mood lights, so we can, they can change themselves or we can change the settings. So you can set different mood colours, can you? Very good. Do you think you'll get spaces like this in, in university? Well, I think universities would have probably thought more about that because they're more experienced with students, maybe they're bigger, <laughs> and there's more students, so they have more opinions. I know that when I go to university, there's going to be like a range of different types of learning styles, and I'll be able to choose the styles that I like to learn in, and it'll be more independent. Yeah, dream on. Um, <laughs> now, it's very it's hard not to listen to that and be absolutely confident that... that what will be happening with your schools for sure is they will be offering degree level work. Um, Jim and I have been involved for, it, blimey, it seems like forever, doesn't it, mate? You know, <laughs> um, uh, a third millennium school for Portland, and, uh, and it has some key characteristics. It, it's actually Portland's interesting in many ways. It's down there on the English south coast. It's an island which is great for inclusion, so everybody on the island will go to the school. Uh, and uh, it's got some fabulous little schools uh, that are closing themselves down to build a new school. So why would you shut a little tiny school and build a school of 1,800 children? And the answer is because it's going to be the best school in the universe. And, but look at the features that it's going to have. It's a 0 to 21 school. You better go right through and graduate out at the other. There's no phase break. There's no break at primary, secondary, junior, middle. So you, you've seen the research. It's damning. Every time you get well, at 11, you saw the Cambridge University research 1997, 44% <laughs> of kids go backwards one year after joining the one year after joining secondary school. They're backward of where they were when they left primary school. And uh, for certain, you know, your schools, if you're in secondary, you are already, I think, embracing primary schools properly as part of your institution. But you will be embracing university work as well. You'd be mad not to. And this is schools within schools, little tiny. Um, uh, home bases of about 350, actually we've made them a little bit bigger. Uh, it's built in the middle of a business park, so it's enterprise-led. This is I'm doing this now with um, Rod Aldridge and his, uh, and his group of academies, and it has a sports and environmental focus. We're even doing degrees for mums. You know, so we are at a really interesting stage, I think, where, golly gosh, so much is possible. Um, and, and it's important, I think, for, for these reasons. If you, if you look at what happened in business in the last century, uh, scarcity was what it was all about. You know, people built huge, um, powerful cartels, really. The music industry were dominated by cartels, and they spent most of their money on lawyers to protect, to be honest, the lie, you know, that, that recorded music was as exciting as, as, as performing live music, which it quite patently was. Imagine turning up to the Louvre and taking a picture of the Mona Lisa and somebody says, oh, you, you think the picture's good, wait till you see the copy on my phone. I mean, it's complete nonsense. So... Uh, uh, but, but lawyers built those cartels um, f for really 50 years at the end of the century. Then as we rolled through the century, the, the hugely highly paid professions were, of course, geeks. Uh, blimey, I remember sitting with Biz Stone in Doha after Twitter had taken off, and here's a lad who'd gone from being a, you know, a geek to a billionaire in about 18 months. And he was looking very well on it, you know, and, and it was fundamentally all about the scale. And then finally, you know, that's not about geekhood anymore. Finally, it's about memberships and about enduring, and about contributions, and about learning. You know, and the uber professionals of the rest of this century are going to be learning professionals, and the uber institutions are going to be our schools. If you stand on the roof of a school, there is no place left in the community that's got the number of graduates you've got. Talking about anything as complex 
or as subtle as learning. You know, learning is different in every... You know, it's a windy day today, schools are different to when it's not a windy day. You know, where else in the community has that level of intellectual engagement? Schools are the intellectual powerhouses at the heart of our community. It's not universities, not banks, not anything else really. And, uh, and as a handover to Jim, just leave yourself with the thought that if schools are full of things like this, they won't take advantage of what the kids could do. This is a school in, in Chicago with a special room for the 21st century. I took the picture this year. Um, this is a school where you can't do this, a school where you can't do that, a school where you can only go in the computer lab if you're in detention. This is one where you must have your phones turned off, note the underlining. This is another one. This is, oh, well, this is in America, of course, <laughs> where you're not allowed your guns. Here's a, here's a learning resource centre. We're not allowed learning resources. You're not allowed cycling. You're not allowed ball games. That's, I think, what the kids <laughs> have done. And, and I can honestly say, in 25 years of all this, in 25 years of, of 35 years of projects, I can honestly say there has not been a single moment <coughs> when the kids haven't astonished me. Every project I've been involved with, if we weren't scared at night, we didn't wake up in a cold sweat that we'd gone too far, they didn't succeed. Any, any more than just regular run-of-the-mill project. Everything succeeds because the baseline is so low. But, you know, the, the talking heads of 21,000 head teachers, the Tesco School Net, the Guinness Book of Records, biggest interlearning project in the world, every single project <laughs> been involved with, every single one, terrified us at the beginning. If you're not scared of where you're going with your school, properly scared, you're not being brave enough and you will get lost and you'll get left behind. Thank you very much.